Chapter 19 A heavy hand landed on Brady's shoulder. He turned from John's crushed body and stared up at a middle-aged policeman with piercing dark eyes. You know this kid? the officer asked. Brady nodded. He's... He swallowed hard. He was my best friend, John Davis. I was talking to him just a few minutes ago. Oh? The officer's hand tightened on Brady's shoulder. And where did this conversation take place? Not here, Brady told him quickly. On the phone, he called me at home. He was worried because... His gaze drifted back to John. He began to shake. Let's go in another room, the cop suggested. I have to ask you some questions. Come on. Feeling like a sleepwalker, Brady let the officer guide him out of the living room and down the hall to the kitchen. A policewoman joined them. Brady sat down shakily at the round wooden table. He and John used to pig out on junk food at this table, play cards, talk about cars and girls. Girls. Rasha. What did John find out about her? Okay. The dark-eyed officer interrupted Brady's thoughts. Tell us your name, son. Name, address, phone number. The policewoman pulled a pen from her pocket and flipped open a small spiral notebook. Brady gave the information. He gazed at the refrigerator. A yellow banana magnet clamped John's senior picture to its door. John gazed out, freckle-faced and smiling. Brady drew in a shuddering breath and lowered his eyes. All right, Brady. John called you. He was worried. The dark-eyed officer hitched his chair closer to the table. What was he worried about? I don't know for sure, Brady replied. My call waiting beeped. Must have been the wrong number, though, because nobody answered. Anyway, when I came back to John, he wasn't on the line anymore. That's when someone attacked him, Brady thought. That's when John died. He shuddered again. We know what a shock this is, Brady, the second officer said softly. A neighbor walked through the open door and found John. We're through questioning him. Someone is notifying John's parents right now. They'll be here soon, so help us out. We know it's hard, but you have to tell us whatever you know. Sure, Brady's hands shook. He clasped them on the table. Okay, when John called, he said somebody was here. The officer leaned forward. Who? Did he say who? Brady nodded. A girl. A girl with scars all over her face. As the second police officer scribbled in her notebook, Brady described the scarred girl. Then he told them everything he knew, how the girl had been watching him, calling him, warning him about Rasha, how she showed up in his hospital room, told him Rasha wanted to kill him. When John called, he said the scarred girl was here, Brady repeated. He told me he learned something about Rasha, but he never got the chance to tell me what, and I don't know who the scarred girl is. I don't know anything about her. We'll find her, the first officer assured him. He motioned to his partner, who left the kitchen. Do you think she killed John? Brady asked. The policeman shook his head. No idea yet. We'll know more when we find her and ask her some questions. He shoved his chair back and stood up. I think that's enough now, Brady. I'll get one of my officers to drive you home. No, that's okay. Brady got to his feet. I have my car. Besides, he wanted to be alone. The officer escorted him out of the kitchen and down the hall. As they passed the living room, Brady glanced quickly inside. John's broken body still lay sprawled in front of the couch. Brady stumbled, caught himself, then hurried out the front door. Snow continued to swirl down, heavier now. Brady's earlier footprints were almost filled. He used his bare hands to shove the snow from the windshield, then climbed into his car and started home. Snow covered the road. The car skidded as Brady turned the corner, almost spinning around. Brady twisted the wheel. The tires spun. Slow down, Brady told himself. Concentrate on the road. But the image of John's flattened body kept flashing through his mind, and questions kept swirling in his head. Did the scarred girl kill John? Why? Who is she? What did John learn about Rasha? Something the scarred girl didn't want him to know? It didn't make sense. Nothing made sense. The car skidded again. Headlights flashed in Brady's eyes. A horn honked angrily. Brady clamped his hands on the wheel and gritted his teeth as he steered around the oncoming car. Just get home, he thought. Get home and call Rasha. She has to know that girl. She has to have some answers. After a few more skids, Brady finally reached his house. No car tracks in the driveway. His parents weren't back yet. Brady trudged up the snowy walk and onto the porch. He stamped his feet on the mat and shoved open the door. In the silence of the house, he heard the answer machine click off. It was Mom, Brady thought, tracking snow into the living room. She stuck at the store, wants me to come get her. 
He walked to the desk and punched the button to hear the message. Hi, Brady. Rasha's voice sounded happy, excited. Just wanted to make sure we're still on for dancing later tonight. If your injury is better. Plus, if you get home in time, why don't you come to the park? I'm going there right now to go sledding. Please come if you can. Bye, Brady. The answering machine clicked off. I'm on my way, Rasha, Brady murmured. I'm definitely on my way. He hurried out of the living room and down the hall. Snow blew into his face as he yanked open the front door. Brady tugged it shut behind him and sprinted down the steps to his car. The wheels spun as he sped out of the drive. I have a lot of questions, Rasha, Brady thought. As the car rocked and slithered its way down the snow-covered road toward Shadyside Park, like, why did the scarred girl kill John? And what do you know about her, Rasha? You have to know something. And for once, I'm going to get some answers. Chapter 20 Wind-driven flakes pelted the side of Brady's car and blew into his face through the car window. He had to keep it open so the windshield wouldn't fog up. Ignoring the icy sting on his skin, Brady hunched over the steering wheel and squinted into the blurry whiteness. Shadyside High appeared. Snowdrifts curled like waves against its walls. It had taken 15 minutes to get this far. It should have taken about three. Brady cautiously made the turn onto Park Drive. The rear end of the car swung wide. He twisted the wheel. The car slithered sideways. The tires spun, then finally dug in. Brady let his breath out and gently pressed the gas pedal. He had to see Rasha. He had to get some answers. But the roads were treacherous. Brady had to keep the car at a crawl. He clenched his jaws and cursed the weather. Past the school now. Not much farther to the park. The car inched forward through the piling snow. A hill rose ahead. Not a steep one. But in this weather, any hill was a problem. Brady floored the gas pedal, hoping to get a running start. The tire spun and whined. No traction at all. The car shuddered, then began to backslide. As the car coasted backward, Brady turned the wheel and let it drift toward the curb. The park is only a block away, he thought. Close enough. He shoved the door open and stepped into the whirling snow. Get to Rasha and get some answers. The cold pierced his jacket as he plunged through a snowdrift and into the park. Without gloves, his hands felt like blocks of ice. The stitches in his side pulled painfully. But Rasha said she'd be here. He had to talk to her. By the time Brady reached the bottom of Miller Hill, the cold had seeped deep inside him, chilling his bones. Shivering violently, he gazed up at the steepest sledding hill in the park. Impossible to see anything but blowing snow. He sucked in a deep breath of icy air. Rasha, he shouted. Rasha! The wind snatched the sound and spun it away. He cupped his hands around his mouth and screamed again. Rasha! Rasha! No answer. Just a tick, tick of icy snowflakes blowing against his jacket. Had Rasha changed her mind and returned home once she saw how bad the storm was? You've come this far, Brady thought to himself. Go on up. Check out the top of the hill first, just to make sure. He paused a moment and tried to still his shaking muscles, tried to gather some strength. Usually, he'd approach Miller Hill from the other side, a gentle slope. No chance of that now. Go on, he told himself. Climb it. Rasha might be up there. Thinking of Rasha gave him some energy. Brady drew more freezing air into his lungs and began the steep climb. His legs sank deep into snow with each step. Halfway up the steep hill, he leaned against a pine tree to rest. He caught his breath, then tried calling Rasha again. Still no response. But she might be up there, Brady. She might be waiting for you. Don't turn back now. He plunged ahead, using bushes and tree trunks to help pull himself up. Brady finally staggered onto the top of Miller Hill. He bent over, gasping for a moment. The wound in his side throbbed. He straightened up slowly and glanced around. The snow had let up. The clouds had begun to thin. Storm is almost over, he thought, but no sign of Rasha. Had she left already? Was he too late? Rasha, he shouted. Rasha, are you up here? He trudged over and peered down the short side of the hill. No one in sight. Brady shoved his cold hands deep into his jacket pockets and glanced around again. There! Running toward him along the ridge, honey blonde hair flying out behind her, legs pumping through the snow, red lips open in a smile. Brady! Rasha called out. He raised his arm and waved. A surge of warmth pumped through him as he hurried to meet her. Warmth and relief. Now they could talk. They met at the center of the hilltop. Rasha threw her arms around Brady's neck. I'm so glad you came, Brady, she cried clinging tightly to him. Brady held her close. I'm glad you're here, he murmured into her silky hair. 
I was afraid you left. Of course I didn't leave. Rasha kissed his cheek, tilted her head back, and smiled at him. I've been waiting for you, as I said I would. Brady gazed into her sparkling green eyes. Rasha? Isn't it great out here? Rasha interrupted, glancing around the snow-covered hill. Aren't you glad you came? Brady ignored the view. Yeah, but Rasha, I have to talk to you. Sure, Brady, talk. She laughed and kissed his cheek again. Oh, your face is so cold. Yeah, the snow really did a number on me, Brady admitted. You poor thing. Rasha slipped her arm around his waist. I'm so sorry I made you come out in this storm. But look, she added, pointing toward the sky. It's over now. As Brady looked up, sunlight broke through the clouds. It shone on Rasha's blonde hair and sparkled on the snowy slope of Miller Hill. It's beautiful, isn't it? Rasha repeated, gazing down at the steep hill. Perfect, don't you think? But Brady wasn't interested in the view. He had to tell Rasha about John and the scarred girl. He had to get some answers to his questions. Rasha. She turns to him, cutting off his words again. Looks just the way it did on our sledding afternoon, doesn't it? She asked. Huh? Brady frowned. What are you talking about? Our sledding afternoon, Rasha repeated. Brady stared at her, totally confused. We never... Don't tell me you've forgotten, Brady, Rasha interrupted. I haven't forgotten. After all, that was the day you killed me. Chapter 21 Brady gaped at her, baffled. What are you talking about? Rasha's grip tightened around Brady's waist. Her sexy, throaty voice turned harsh. Can't you figure it out? I'm not Rasha. I'm Sharon. You're crazy, Brady cried. Sharon is dead. Not anymore. Rasha's beautiful mouth curved into a smile. A dangerous smile. Brady tried to step away, but Rasha's arm tightened around his waist, held him, trapped him. You're crazy, Brady repeated. You can't be Sharon. Can't you figure it out, Brady? Rasha demanded coldly. I'll give you a clue. Rasha, what? The clue is in my name, she told him. Rasha Nelson? Sharon Knowles? Ever hear of anagrams, Brady? What? Brady's mind whirled. Anagrams? But Rasha, you can't... You don't get it. Rasha tossed her hair and laughed sarcastically. You're totally stumped. Unbelievable. I don't know what I ever saw in you. Rasha! Brady started again. I'm Sharon, Rasha insisted. Her green eyes glittered angrily. Think about it, Brady. An anagram is when you jumble the letters of a word and make another word out of them. Even in shock, Brady's mind jumbled the letters of Sharon Knowles and turned them into Rasha Nelson. Rasha Nelson. Sharon Knowles. Very good, Brady, Rasha declared. I see you get it now. How come you didn't get it sooner? Couldn't you recognize the girl you killed? You're nuts, Brady yelled. He wrenched himself free from her grip and stumbled back. You're totally crazy. Sharon is dead. She fell and died. I didn't kill her. Rasha's hand shot out and grabbed his arm. Look, Brady, she ordered, pointing down the steep slope. Look at Miller Hill. Remember that afternoon, a year ago? Brady gazed down the steep hill. I didn't want to sled on it, remember? Rasha muttered. I thought it was too dangerous. I was afraid, but you forced me. No! Shut up and listen, Brady, Rasha hissed in his ear. I told you I didn't want to sled down it, but you made me. You grabbed me and pushed me onto my sled. I kept saying I didn't want to do it, remember? But you didn't listen. You shoved my sled over the edge of the hill. You forced me. And you killed me. You're crazy, Brady screamed. You're crazy. Of course I'm crazy. Rasha laughed wildly. Brady tried to pull away again. Her fingers dug painfully into his arm, kept him close to her. Of course I'm crazy, Rasha repeated. That's why I came back, back from the dead, to kill you. But you're not Sharon, Brady protested, staring at Rasha's beautiful face. You don't look anything like Sharon. She had light brown hair, blue eyes. She... Oh, Brady, you're really so stupid, Rasha exclaimed in disgust. My plan wouldn't work if I came back as Sharon. I had to borrow a body, Brady. I borrowed the most beautiful face and body I could find. Brady gazed at Rasha's sparkling green eyes, her shiny blonde hair, her perfect face. No, he thought. No. Don't you think I knew what a sucker you'd be for a face and body like this? Rasha asked, stepping closer to him. Of course I knew. That's why I picked it. To trap you. Laughing insanely, Rasha stepped even closer. And it worked, she whispered fiercely. It worked perfectly. You fell for me, exactly as I knew you would. And now I've got you, Brady, right where I want you. Brady jerked his arm. Rasha's fingers gripped it like steel bands. He couldn't get loose. She raised her free hand and touched his face. 
For a split second, Brady thought she was going to kiss him. Could she have been kidding? He wondered hopefully. Could this whole thing be some kind of weird, crazy joke? She can't be Sharon, back from the dead. She can't. Slowly, Rasha's finger slid down his cheek, under his chin, onto his neck. She dropped his arm, brought her hand up to join the other one. Her fingers wrapped around his throat. She pressed her thumbs against his windpipe, harder. Brady tried to pull away, tried to raise his arms, to shove her, break free, break free and run, but he couldn't move, couldn't move a muscle. Rasha's grip was fierce, inhuman. Her fingers wrapped tighter, pressed harder as she strangled him, strangled him. No air, Brady's brain screamed. No air. His eyes bulged. His lungs shrieked for air. She's killing you, his mind screamed. Fight. Save yourself. The bright snow began to dim. Darker. Darker. I'm dead, Brady realized. She killed me. Chapter 22 Helpless against Rasha's strength, Brady dropped to his knees in the snow. Rasha sank with him her hands still wrapped around his throat. Everything faded to black. You're dead, Brady's mind whispered frantically. She's killed you. You're dead. That's enough, Sharon, a voice cried out from nearby. You're finished now. Incredibly, Sharon's fingers loosened from Brady's throat. It's over, Sharon, the voice shouted. It's all over for you. Sharon's hands dropped away. Brady pitched forward into the snow. As he shoved himself up to his knees, he looked up, gasping. The scarred girl stood a few yards away. Her eyes glittered with rage. Rage at Sharon. You've had your fun, Sharon, the scarred girl declared coldly. Now give me back my body. She stepped closer. No, Sharon cried, springing to her feet. Give it back, the girl demanded. I'm keeping this body, Sharon insisted. It's mine now. It's mine, the girl shouted. She advanced another step. You took it from me. You killed me for it and I'm going to keep it. Sharon spun away, kicking a spray of snow into Brady's face. Brady staggered weakly to his feet. He trembled all over. The glaring snow stabbed at his eyes. He blinked and tried to focus. How could the scar girl be alive? She just said she was dead. She said Sharon killed her. How could any of this be happening? You killed me, Sharon, the girl repeated. Her scars blazed red in the cold air. Her ruined face twisted hideously. I was beautiful, so beautiful. I had everything to live for, and you took it all away. Yes, Sharon exclaimed. You didn't even know me, the girl continued, but you killed me. You killed me and stole my beautiful body. Brady's throat ached. Questions whirled in his mind, but he couldn't speak. His arms hung limply. His legs could barely hold him upright. Shaken and dazed, all he could do was watch as the scarred girl stalked slowly across the snow, stalked towards Sharon. I was weak for so long, the girl told Sharon. You thought I'd stay that way forever, didn't you? But I didn't. I'm strong now. Strong, Sharon sneered. You're dead. You're nothing. Nothing but a shell. A weak, hideous, disgusting shell. The girl shook her head. Her lips peeled back from her teeth in an ugly smile. Not anymore, she insisted. It took me weeks. But now I'm strong enough to take my beautiful body back. Brady shook his head, tried to make the voices stop. None of this made sense. This girl talked about being dead. Dead? How could she be dead? How could Sharon be alive? Did you hear me, Sharon? The girl shouted. I want my body back. No, never, Sharon screamed. I'm never going back inside that ugly, scarred body again. Never. With a howl of rage, the scarred girl sprang through the air. She knocked Sharon to her knees. Brady watched helplessly as she twisted her fingers into Sharon's shiny blonde hair and pulled Sharon's face into the snow. I'm taking it back, she shouted. I'm taking my beautiful body back. Never. Sharon threw her off and aimed a vicious kick at the girl's scarred face. Never, she shrieked. The girl leaped back, then charged at Sharon again. Brady gasped as her nails clawed at Sharon's skin. He gasped again as Sharon's fingers gouged into the scarred girl's eyes, digging, twisting, shrieking. The girl drew her fist back and slammed it into Sharon's stomach. Sharon stumbled back, her breath heaving. The girl flew at her and knocked her to the ground. Brady wrapped his arms around himself, still trembling, still weak. Too weak to do anything but watch in horror as the two girls swirled through the snow in a raging battle. Would Sharon win? And what would happen to him if she did? Chapter 23 I'm taking it, the girl roared. 
I'm taking my body back. She tore at Sharon's glossy hair, ripping clumps out by the roots. No, Sharon screamed. She rolled to her back, bent her legs, then kicked out with both feet at the girl's chest. The girl sprawled backward. Sharon leaped on her. Brady tried to yell. Nothing emerged but a croak. He swallowed painfully and tried again. Stop, he shouted. You're both crazy. His voice was stronger this time, but it made no difference. The two girls continued to tear into each other. Their arms and legs became a blur as they tumbled over and over, punching and kicking. With a fierce cry, the scarred girl rolled on top of Sharon and grabbed her arm. Brady heard a horrible ripping noise. Sharon's arm! The scarred girl tore Sharon's arm off at the shoulder. Bright red blood spurted from the torn socket and splattered across the snow. No! Brady cried. No! The girl bared her teeth in a hideous grin and grabbed for Sharon's other arm. But Sharon slithered away, then dived for the girl's leg. The girl screamed in agony as her leg ripped loose. Sharon flung the leg across the snow. No! Brady screamed again. He squeezed his eyes shut and shook his head violently. He opened his eyes in time to see another leg spinning through the air. Another arm. Sharon dragged herself through the snow, leaving a trail of blood. Her breath came in hoarse, ragged gasps. She wrapped her remaining arm around the scarred girl's neck. Both of them began to pull at each other. No! Brady could only moan now. No! They pulled harder. Harder. Brady stared in horror as their necks twisted, strained, snapped. Their heads ripped off, both heads, mouths locked in silent screams. Arms and legs, bodies and heads whirled through the snow, then began to tumble down the steep sledding hill. Brady gazed in horror as the body parts rolled and tumbled through the snow, rolling through the trees, bouncing through the bushes, down, down, all the way down Miller Hill, and then vanished in the snow, vanished completely. Brady heard the sound of his breathing, saw nothing but clean white snow, sparkling brightly in the sun. Epilogue Brady trudged along the sidewalk toward Allie's house. He left his car at the park yesterday, and he knew he had to dig it out. But first, he wanted to see Allie. He gazed up at the morning sun. Its rays were weak and didn't warm him at all, but he knew Allie would warm him up. The thought made him smile. Along Allie's block, People shoveled their sidewalks and dug their cars out. A friend of Brady's mother waved at him across the top of her car. Then she called his name. Brady didn't stop. He had to see Allie. He had to make everything all right with her. Farther along the block, a little kid lobbed a snowball at him. Brady saw it coming, but he didn't try to duck or move out of the way. The snowball splattered against the side of his coat, but it didn't matter to him. Nothing mattered except Allie. Allie's long driveway was still covered with snow. No one had shoveled yet. Brady plunged into it and staggered toward the house. The porch and steps had been cleared. Brady climbed up and pushed the doorbell. Waited. Waited. No one came. She has to be here, he thought. I need to talk to her. She has to be here. Shivering, Brady turned and shuffled back across the porch. As he started down the steps, he heard a metallic scraping sound coming from the back of the house. Snow shovel. Someone out back, shoveling the terrace. Let it be Allie, he thought desperately as he rounded the corner of the house. I need to see her. Let it be Allie. Allie stood at the bottom of the back terrace, scraping the last of the snow from the steps. She wore jeans tucked into bright blue snow boots, yellow gloves but no jacket, just a heavy fisherman's sweater. Her auburn hair glowed like fire in the morning sun. Aren't you cold? Brady asked. Allie jumped. Brady, you scared me, she exclaimed. Sorry. Brady smiled at her with numb lips. I just wondered why he didn't have a jacket on. It's cold out here. Aren't you cold? Shaking her head, Allie started shoveling the back walk. I've been doing this for half an hour. I feel like I'm in a sauna. She tossed a shovel full of snow to the side and glanced at him. You look awful, Brady. Just awful. I know. I didn't sleep very well, he told her. Maybe you should go home and go back to bed, she said. What are you doing here anyway? She's still angry, Brady thought. He couldn't blame her, but he had to try to make things right. I, um, he approached her shyly. I came to apologize again. Allie gazed at him silently, her gray eyes doubtful. I acted really dumb, Brady continued. I came to say I'm sorry, really sorry. She stared at him a moment longer. Well, thanks for the apology, Brady. She turned away and began to scrape up more snow. I mean it, Allie, Brady declared. I feel terrible about everything. I acted like a super jerk. I don't blame you for hating me, but I want to get back together. Can you take me back? 
Oh, Brady, Allie sighed. I don't know. I'm not sure. Please, he pleaded. It will be different this time, I promise. Remember how it was when we first started going together? Of course I do, Allie replied softly. It was great. I thought it would stay that way. I know, but it can be like that again, Allie, Brady promised. All you have to do is take me back, and everything will be the way it used to be. Everything will be perfect. Allie sighed again and leaned on the shovel. I just... Please, Brady interrupted. Please say yes, Allie. He shivered, waited tensely for her answer. After a long minute, Allie smiled. Well, okay, Brady, she said. Yes, let's start over again. That's great. That's so great, Brady murmured with a sigh of relief. He stepped closer and cupped her cheek in his hand. Allie flinched and jerked her head away. Sorry, she exclaimed with a little laugh, but your hand is freezing. Yeah, Brady agreed. I'm cold all over. That's something I have to talk to you about, Brady told her. See, there's just one small problem. Allie glanced up, a questioning expression in her gray eyes. You remember Rasha, don't you? Brady asked. Allie dropped his hands. What's going on, Brady? I mean, I thought it was over between you and Rasha. Well, it is, but... Brady hesitated. There is one slight problem. Problem? What problem? Allie demanded. I'm dead, Brady told her. Huh? Allie stared at him. It's true, he explained. That's why I look so bad. I died yesterday. Rasha killed me up on Miller Hill. Brady, stop joking, Allie pleaded. That's sick. That's really sick. It's not funny. I'm not joking, Allie, Brady insisted. She strangled me. Rasha strangled me. I'm dead. Stop it, Allie backed up a step. Brady reached out and took hold of her hand. That's why I'm so cold, Allie. So cold. So cold. Because I'm dead. Brady, please, Allie cried. Brady tugged on her hand, pulling her close to him. He leaned down and kissed her lips. You're so warm, and I'm so cold. Allie wrenched herself away. Stumbling backward, she gazed at him in horror. Yuck! Your lips, she shrieked. They're so cold. Take me back anyway, Brady pleaded desperately. He staggered toward her. Okay, Allie? Take me back, even though I'm dead. Okay? Okay? Her eyes wide with terror, Allie opened her mouth and began to scream. Hi, it's Chris with Nightfall Audiobooks. Thank you for joining me for The Perfect Date. This was a fun book. The opening was very, very strong, and the ending was just as strong. Everything in the middle was great, too. I gotta say, I've dated girls like Rasha. They're terrible. Don't date them. Don't give them any time of day. Certainly don't marry them. I didn't. And that's about the extent of my dating advice. If you run into a girl that's acting like Rasha, you run for the hills. What was the deal with the ending? Rasha is really Sharon, and she took someone's body somehow that wasn't explained, and they tore each other's body parts off because the Scar Girl is really Rasha's body, but Rasha has the Scar Girl's body. So this is sort of like the book Switched, where the personalities change bodies, but not really. So that was never explained, the whole body-changing thing. And then somehow, Brady is a zombie at the end, and I guess he wants to take over Allie's body, but she had to say yes, kind of like a vampire? I have no idea. This is all over the map. I don't understand how any of this is functioning. So are they both super strong? How do they change bodies? None of that stuff's explained. I wanted to point out something else. John Davis, Brady's best friend. That's the cartoonist that does the Garfield comic strip. And Garfield and Friends. And all of those excellent Garfield holiday specials that we saw growing up. John Davis? For real? We're going to kill John Davis in a Fear Street novel? But I mean, why not? I guess it's still considered artistic liberty. And there is always that disclaimer saying that this is a work of fiction, and any relationship it has to people, alive or dead, is completely coincidental. It just seems to be a little too on the nose to be a coincidence. That's all. Anyway, this was a lot of fun to read. I would highly recommend this to anybody who wants to get into Fear Street. This is a great novel. It captures a lot of the Fear Street aura that keeps Fear Street alive and fresh and fun. There's unexplained supernatural stuff. There's a lot of terror happening. There's a lot of interpersonal relationships going on. Great dialogue between John and Brady, and Brady fighting over who he wants to be with. This is an excellent, excellent story. I hope to read more like this. Thank you very much for listening. If you want to get in touch with me, 
You can write me an email at nightfallaudiobooks at gmail.com. I'm also on YouTube at Nightfall Audiobooks. Feel free to comment, like, subscribe. Tell your friends, tell your mom, tell whoever you think would like to listen to me tell them tales from Fear Street. So thank you very much for listening, and I will see you next time.